is the hobo king like contractually obligated obligated Dude. to take anyone down there? Because it's like he sees Andrew Garfield. He's like, well, clearly you're not supposed to be here. So why? I don't know. Whatever. I guess I'll just do it. I'm paid in fucking buttons to take people down here, like rubber pieces of rubber. And doesn't flint. seem like a good financial move on his part. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of I Finally Watched. I'm Milan. And this is David, and today we finally watched Under the Silver Lake. So, we kind of already agreed to do a 24 August, um, but this is specially requested by my wife, Taylor, because she's a very big Andrew Garfield fan. And honestly, I think when I first heard about this, it was like right when it was coming out, or soon after it came out, but it was always one that I wanted to watch i just like it i never got around to it if that makes sense yeah so i really almost wish we had waited to do this for like a neo-noir month like we could have done this with rear window i didn't know this was a neo-noir i knew it was a mystery i didn't know it was this much new noir but like if we did this rear window brick and then like another one i wish we could do um what's the one we've both seen inherent vice no, we did Inherent Vice on the pod. Um, oh, Disturbia? Yeah, Disturbia. That's the other one I was thinking of. Yeah, but Disturbia is not really like, oh, this kid turns into a PI all of a sudden, but he he's like noticing these things, like witnessing these things. And then, but this is Andrew Garfield fucking turns into like a PI. Yeah, and so Taylor said she wanted to watch this and you basically was like, you assholes never watch anything I want to watch, so do this one. So you made it your choice. And then I looked it up and David Robert Mitchell, who directed It Follows, which is my favorite horror movie ever. I was like, fuck yeah, let's do this. Um, I'm three minutes into the movie and a squirrel dies rather violently. I think like, does it commit suicide? Well, no, something had happened to it and it just falls to the ground and dies in front of us. But like I texted you guys because Taylor always gets mad about me making you guys watch movies where an animal gets done, which that's not the last animal in this movie. No. So what's funny is we're watching this, right? And and the first thing you see in the movie opening up, it says, beware the dog killer. Right. And I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, okay. Ominous. Right. And then we see the squirrel dies and she's shocked. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I knew it was a squirrel. She goes, you didn't tell me it was a squirrel. I was like, oh, well, too bad. And then um, I was thinking, I was like, beware the dog killer. I'm like, this is not going to be the only animal that died. <laughs> and it's funny, isn't it? That she's the one who suggested us watching this. And it's like, it had a lot of dead animals in this movie. Does, I can't remember if uh, Sarah Riley Keough's dog dies. It does. It's, uh, it's remains are found in the burned car. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So in order to talk about this movie, I want to talk about, the end first because i think that'll i think it'll just make it more interesting to talk about the movie throughout if we talk about the end if you're gonna do that then i'm gonna put a i'm gonna say something that happens at the end if we're talking about the end and then we can i'll i want to mention something that that occurs throughout the whole movie but not like annoyingly so like maybe four points throughout the whole movie okay yeah so this movie i think pretty like not subtly says at the end of the movie that andrew garfield is the dog killer okay do you agree i so that's what taylor thought and i can totally see how you would think that not you specifically but like one would think (laughs) but like one would think that lesser Um, minds would think that (laughs) but the and we'll talk about him now this is a homeless king character kind of questions him on why he has dog treats in his pocket almost being like Hey, we do all this nasty shit, but if you are the dog killer, we're we're gonna kill you, right? Yeah. And he puts him in this line of questioning. It's like, why do you have dog treats in your pocket? And I think he actually comes up with a like a really good reason, a really good on, lie on the fly. Yeah. I you agree. think it's a good lie? You think it's a lie? So I think, and there's a it like. You know, you were telling me that a lot of people say, hey, you have to rewatch this movie. And I read some reviews that said that, too, like that multiple rewatches, you pick up more and more. But 
one of the reasons I actually like really, really like this movie and it will, I think it'll turn into like really loving this movie is that I was like picking stuff up afterwards, just thinking about the movie in my head. Yeah. It's a movie that stays with you. But so there's a weird scene and this movie hits you with things in the face, but still does it in sort of a subtle way. So he just goes to this random party at one point. It's at the billionaire's house. The billionaire's daughter, daughter, Millicent, is there, right? And he's walking by the pool. And then this person just goes, oh, hey, how, how are you doing? Are, are you doing okay? And she's like, uh, yeah, how are you doing? I've been seeing your billboards. So that was his ex-girlfriend. Right. That's the girl who he's like, I, you know, he couldn't get over. That's the one like, oh, I used to, you know, be able to pet her dog. And I have these dog treats on her so I can pet her dog again. Yeah, I think she broke up with him, and then I think life became meaningless, and he started murdering dogs. And I think, and my read on it is that he got so infatuated with Sarah Riley Keough, it was almost his way out of this like world he had created for himself, where he was just the dog killer, and he like saw some sort of hope with her because he's banging all these other girls that aren't like, you know, the girl. And I think he had sort of built up in one night, this Riley Keough character, because a lot of the other times, you know, like uh, the actress girl who I thought was a stripper, her name in the movie is actress uh, played by Ricky Lindholm. Yeah. Um, you know, she comes over just to fuck. Like that's yeah. what they do. He fucks the, the topless lady, the hippie lady at the end. There's all these other random women throughout that he like is like, they're like, Oh, the balloon girls. Like, you want to fuck? He's like, yeah. But I think like this kind of, almost cutesy night he has with Keo's character. He like sees almost like, like almost like true love. You know what I mean? Like he falls for her. Right. And so I think that's why he becomes so infatuated so quickly. And then at the end, she's like, you like barely know me. Why are you like this? He's like, yeah. Like in his head, he's almost like, yeah, that's, yeah, it is kind of crazy. Right. Basically risking your life for me. Right. Yeah. Um, right. And, and the whole message of the movie at the end of it is like, you know, there's there's symbols everywhere. Everything's a symbol for someone, right? And what's so interesting is that this movie, and I had to read up on it, I had to do a lot of research, dude. This movie is full of symbols with a ending message that the internet still to this day is still trying to figure out. But I got to the bottom of a Reddit, a subreddit about this movie that I that the guy thinks he f- actually figured it out. So I'd like to explore that with uh, with you today um, while we go through the movie. Um, but I'm not I'm not going to like, you know, dwell on it or be too too like um, filled with detail about it. But I will point it out. I will tell you what it means and we will move on from there. If that sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. So, let, I mean, we can start from the top a little bit. So I, I we already you already talked about the beware of dog killer sign in the, in the beginning. I just like the fact that she's like not getting any of it off as she's trying to wipe it. She's like continually wiping and not making a dent at all Well, we like, see we see it at the end too and it's like barely better <laughs> like she must have gotten fired she's not very good at that part of the job and then you also see in the coffee shop andrew garfield just staring at like this hot blonde behind the counter so, hint number one uh when he's staring at her you see in chalk like a chalkboard of the menu of the cafe being written above her uh-huh and at the bottom of the chalkboard is Morse code. What does the Morse code say? It says um, these three words, but three is spelled incorrectly. It's T H R E. So the three words. And that'll come up later in the movie. And I'll talk about it when it comes up. You know, you sound like the Andrew Garfield character in this movie. And I think that's kind of the point of setting this kind of like like a rabbit trail in the movie is is like you kind of are the character now i think it's cool i think the director kind of and i read this super funny review someone was like if there was more effort in the screenwriting of this movie than the uh as they put into the um hints the clues in the movie it would have been a better movie (laughs) i mean so i feel like there's a lot of like it's it's like the guy had a ton of different ideas for the movie things he wanted to put in and like he didn't take out any of them which is also why you have like a two hour and 20 minute movie right when this probably should have been like an hour and 50 hour 55 movie 
Yeah. You know, there's certain threads in the movie that I think can be taken out. Well, there's there's parts of the movie that actually you're waiting for them to connect and they never connect to the to the rest of the movie. And then you get to the like to the end. And I'm like, what's this weird Midsommar shit going on right here? You know? Yeah. So, I mean, but actually, I kind of like that because it's also a little bit like what the movie is about. It's very meta in that like. No, definitely. We're, because the whole like the movie from the beginning, I was like the notes I was taking. I was like, oh, is this does this mean something? Does this mean something? To the point of like Topher Grace is in this movie as a nothing character. And I kept thinking like Topher yeah. is somebody. He is something in this. He's the dog killer. He's this. He's that. And he was nothing. And I like I love that. I love that he's in the small kind of meaningless part. But like is there just because every time that character is something at the end of the movie and, so and he wasn't. There's a character named Alan played by Jimmy Simpson and yeah. I know I know him from Psych, the show Psych. Um, and it's funny, he was actually a character in the show as like a huge misdirect being like, oh, he's the killer and he wasn't the killer. Um, but Jimmy Simpson as Alan is just a funny guy who just shows up at these parties. And one thing I want to say about this movie is that having lived in L.A. for such a short period of time, this movie really encompasses what i know of la it's like just a bunch of these random parties a bunch of these same people who show up to these random parties and just they're just trash it's just either trash people or trash music or it's like kind of this like meaningless existence that you go from party to party and it's like maybe something happens but in this in this instance andrew garfield is so certain that he's on to something like he like kind of like you said that like he's hyper focused on this girl because he wants his life to mean something. Yeah. So then next his mom calls about seventh heaven while he's staring at the naked hippie woman. And then we see Riley Keough at the pool. And then uh, the Ricky Lindholm character comes over, which I told you before, she is so typecast as like the girl that is interested in the guy, but he's interested in the main character girl. And it's just yeah. hilarious. Cause like, she's beautiful herself, but like, she's like, I feel like she plays this character all the time in this. Yeah. And, and it's like this, there's then a sex scene, right? Which is like, it's a very odd sex scene because he's like watching women's tennis while having sex. And then the news comes on about the billionaire's death. And it's like the sex scene goes on for a while. And I also thought it was interesting that like his his movie before this, It Follows, is literally about a sexually transmitted disease and there's Killer. no nudity in the entire movie. There's a little nudity, but not not as much as this and definitely not as focused. Oh yeah, wasn't it like a it was like a fucking a dead woman though, right? It was like the ghoul yeah. was a naked woman coming after them or whatever. No, um, there was well, there was that, but there was at the beginning where the woman was on the beach and she was like torn in half. I mostly focused on her fucking leg that was torn off. Well, that that too. Um, I think she was naked. Uh, no, no, no. So, so yeah. Um, this girl is typecast in that, but also she's the uh, half of the uh, comedy singing duo Garfunkel and Oates, and that's where I is moved. that her? Yeah, it is. Huh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Andrew Garfield's character Sam bangs a lot of chicks throughout this thing, and I'm like. It, if it's Andrew Garfield, I understand it. But if it's just this, this guy who looks like Andrew Garfield, I'm like, something, something's up with look, him. He doesn't look good in the movie. And I guess he's an out-of-work actor is what we're supposed to get out of this. We never really know. Yeah. I thought at one point, it, well, so that's what like some of the synopsis say. And at one point, his mom calls, and I thought it was an agent for a second, talking about a, a, you know, a script or whatever she was sending it over. But no, yeah, we have no idea what he does. And what's funny is one of the clues to, I think, to him being the dog killer is like, people always ask me, like, what I do for work. And I feel like he doesn't have a job because he's, like, sleeping throughout the day so that he can go out at night and kill dogs. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, like, all he does now. Yeah, but here's the thing. We see him, right? When we pick up on the story, we see him pretty much his entire life for these next, what, two, three days, something like that. Yeah, but I think he stops killing dogs when he meets Riley Keough. I think he's that infatuated with her. But those missing signs increase. The dogs still are dying. Or at least they're going missing. Because the, the, It's not like we see them date stamped of like my dog was missing like a day ago. 
I feel well, yeah, I guess so, maybe. But the maybe guy, that just adds to the mystery. The guy who um who who writes the comic, the zine as they call it, uh says that over the last two years they've increased the missing posters. Um, but either way. So he next goes And to the this... missing musical instruments, which I thought was weird until later on. Oh yeah, that's true. The, he goes to the bookstore. By the way, there's a bunch of like cool camera movements, like the the hard pan in when the squirrel falls on yeah. him. Yeah. And then the bookstore, the way it kind of follows into the bookstore and then hits him. He goes to the guy who runs the bookstore and says, Hey, I want to talk to the guy that writes this magazine. And it because I think he's the, I think he wanted to talk to him because he's the dog killer. I actually think he wanted I think he was gonna fucking kill this guy. But under the server I mean so the dog killing lore, right, that we understand it to be is like this out of work actor. Well, first of all, this guy finds a videotape in his basement of this out of work actor saying no one will be happy until all the dogs are dead in L.A. Right. Or something like mm-hmm. that. Then he kills himself on screen. And then that guy was an out of work actor that got jealous of a dog's success because it got more screen time than him or whatever. And then it's like and that is the base of of where the dog killers stand. I feel like he has no reason to kill this guy. Maybe, but it was like, why did he want to meet him at that point? He wanted to meet him before he had the interaction with Riley. So why did he want to meet him? I did find it odd that as soon as he did meet him, he was just like, Hey, all this weird shit. And the guy was like, yep, makes sense. Well, I, yeah, that's why it almost feels a little bit fortuitous. But I think his once he met Riley and she went missing, his reason for talking to this guy completely changed. He's like, now I want to talk to you about all this, all this weird shit. Um, so next he meets Riley Keough, um, and by petting her dog, I think he's petting the dog because he's going to kill that dog. But then he talks to her, gets invited inside. They get high. They have this really cute scene where they're watching a Marilyn Monroe movie. Um Mary, like, who wants to marry a millionaire or something yeah, like that? Yeah, which is like, she also has that poster. She has those three dolls. And pause. So in those three dolls, right? Um, those three dolls have their name. So if you look at the dolls and then you look at the TV next to the dolls, the actresses are in a different um, order. order than the dolls are. But under the dolls are uh, Zodiac Killer Code. Okay. And if you if you uh cipher decipher the Zodiac killer code, it says three words. I think one's sheriff, um mountain, something else, whatever, it doesn't matter. But then if you reorder them, okay, if you reorder them in the way that the actresses are on TV. Yeah. The these three words code from the beginning is a website. So if you go to that website and you it's a geo map of those three words. So you geo map the three words and what what it does. I know this is overly complicated, but what it does is that it triangulates places in the real world that those three words show up in. Okay. And if you do all that, it takes you to something called Barren Mountain in Kings Canyon in in, uh, California. And people are saying it is the perfect spot for a um, uh, one of those underground bunker things. Is it Mount Hollywood? It's not Mount Hollywood, but it is like it's weird because it's pyramid shaped and it's right in the middle of like fucking nowhere. And it takes those coordinates, takes you right at the edge of that. And it's like, I don't know what the director is trying to say or trying to do, but someone was like, I've been there. And there's only a certain point to where you're allowed to go past that. And then it, people stop you. People stop you like Rangers. I don't know, dude. It's weird because he goes, I don't want to I don't want to divulge anymore. And the guy was never heard on Reddit since. Ooh. Ooh. But yeah, so so basically. Also, but also she's watching a movie about marrying a millionaire and she's going to spend eternity with a millionaire or billionaire. With- Three women, right? Three women in the show, three women, three women in, the in, the, in the billionaire. Yeah. And then um, I'll just say this so we're not constantly stopping. A little farther on when he throws up in the website, in the website, when he throws up in the bathroom uh, before he can fuck that balloon girl at the graveyard party. She never gets to. Um, 
there's like cipher on the bathroom wall. And that just that's a different cipher for a different type of code. And that translates to coffee menu, which is supposed to bring you all the way back to the Morse code, which is supposed to bring you back to the to the dolls. Maybe there's just if you go up that mountain, there's just like a signed copy of the script. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But you know how people uh, like geocache? Yeah. Yeah. It's a geocache. That's a little bit what this all feels like. It does. It does, honestly. And one guy said, no, that's not right. I actually solved it. And he was also never heard from again. Do you think uh, the, the naked owl lady fucked him to death? Let's talk about that now real quick. Do you think there's actually any correlation between the owl's kiss and everything else going on in this? Or do you think that's like, because what I feel like this movie did is set up different folklores mm -hmm. throughout old Hollywood, right? And he's just kind of in the middle of like three of these folklores happening around him. Like, I don't think the owl's kiss really has anything to do with the missing billionaire. I think the owl's kiss the the death of the zine guy um you know the i think a lot of that can be explained by is andrew garfield like schizophrenic you know insane right um if you think he's the dog killer is there other things wrong with him psychologically that he would murder dogs mm. at, uh, at well, he said right he said so millicent said that hey we got to be careful at night the dog killer's out he's there like, we don't have a dog and she's like well there's it's not a far leap from dog killer and murder and he's like He's like, why would you why would you even think that? Yeah, which is which leads me to believe, like, if you believe all that, that he probably killed the zine killer. And then in his sort of schizophrenic mind, he was watching himself do it. But he, he just imagined it as this owl lady. You know what I mean? That so how he, do you explain how do you explain the owl's kiss in his apartment? I think he imagined that, too. There's like I, definitely. So I, I do. I do like how she screamed like she was scared of she him. saw the gun. She's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the, there's a lot of things that are like. That you just can't like that don't seem to act, they either don't matter or they're just in his head. Right. And so if you if you buy the narrative of like, oh, he's the dog killer and he's a little bit insane that are, you know, psychologically fucked up i mean is that the medical term but i think you can say insane um when when uh when you see weird stuff like he's walking down that trail and he sees the dead the dead dog right sarah's dog and then he walks it's a sarah little bit eating somebody but it's not sarah it's like this weird man what do you mean it's not sarah eating it's severance that she's eating the billionaire but it's not really her well yeah obviously it's not actually her she's uh, yeah it's a man dressed up in a wig as her. Oh, that man was pretty hot. Yeah, no, I don't know. I didn't see it very well. But then, but what I'm saying is that that's obviously a dream sequence because we see him waking up from that. I but mean, yes, yeah, sort we, of. But... We never see him waking up from like bashing the pop songwriter's head in. No, but I think we see him waking up the next day from the owl's kiss. When the cop, I, I, I let's just talk about it now because it really doesn't connect to the plot. But when the cop, knocks on his door um with the uh, landlord to kick him out of his apartment because he's overdue just a few minutes before that he's looking for the naked owl lady in his bedroom because she kind of closed the door closed herself in his bedroom right yeah and they're like yeah you got to get out and he's like no i'll give me one more day and they give him one more day dude there's a fucking killer naked owl lady in my room i'd be like yeah i'm out bye see ya also like they gotta give him I don't know how California uh, eviction laws work, but when the, once the cops get involved, I feel like they have to at least give you time to get your shit out of the house. So I don't know, but um, I, I do remember living in California. I was living in uh, like somewhere off right outside of Beverly Hills, and it was a um, pretty nice place. But I, I used to see cops all the time walking through the hallways, evicting people. And they yeah. were like, they were like, Two sheriffs walk in, get the fuck out. And yeah, I don't know. So um, he's he has that night with her, with RK, uh, Riley Keough. And then uh, RK is how I notated it in my notes. And then she's like, all right, well, yeah, we got to go. I'm going to go to bed. Um, you know, I'll hang out with you tomorrow afternoon. And as he walks out, the roommates don't even take note of him. You know, don't no. like meaningless. And then there's a pirate. Um, sure. 
and she kind of acts, she's acting kind of strange. I'm curious if she knows she's never going to see him again, or if it just happens that they're like, oh, tonight's the night. I feel like that's something you plan for. So she probably knew this is done. Well, it's kind of weird because this pirate, which we don't really get quite how he's involved in this, is like her friends introduced the pirate like, oh, we met someone at the bar and we brought him here. Like, oh, we brought someone here. I'm like, well, if you know he's coming, then you wouldn't say it that way. Right. It's like almost like they just met him because I think the pirate is the recruiter for that hooker site. Right. That's what I felt like it was. Potentially. And so she seemed like she was actually going to see him uh, the next day. But the fireworks after the fireworks, she seemed totally different, totally freaked out because of the fireworks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that means something. Maybe um, like late fireworks or maybe it was Morse code and, and I didn't catch on to it. Although so I after Morse this, code. he goes to his car and he sees the dick keyed into it. And then he sees the kids and he beats the shit out of those kids. As I was watching the scene, I was thinking, God, David, fucking loves this scene i do and then i thought oh that scene is so it's more believable when he kills the songwriter at the end but then once i got to really to the end it's like oh this guy's capable of violence he's the dog killer someone who's capable of that much violence for kids because they keyed his car his car that he doesn't even own (laughs) yeah that's true too i mean if you see a bunch of 13 year olds fucking king cars it, I think if you beat them up, no one's going to really be mad at you about yeah, it. Yeah, but just the fact that you could do it. Like, he really fucked that first kid up. Um, and then he, he kept going. I like how, like, that third kid kind of farther down the street, he's like, hey! And then <laughs> Andrew Garfield stands up, and he's like, fuck, never mind. Fuck, it's Spider-Man. <laughs> um, so the next day, he goes to her place, and she moved out in the middle of the night. And he's like, isn't that weird? And the, guy, the landlord's like, no, maybe she didn't like you. <laughs> And then he finds out he's going to get forcibly removed. Um, then talks to Topher uh, about the bar, the, the dog killer at the bar, which you don't yeah. even see. It's Topher. We kind of just, he's got like such a, you don't see it's Topher until like the second scene with him at the very end where they're like both watching the video camera. But he has such a like distinct voice. He does. Um, and hey, it's see- Spider-Man. It's Spider-Man and Venom. Spider-Man and Spider-Man and Spider-Man. What? Um, so <laughs> what? He breaks into the apartment and then he sees the random girl come in to grab the shoe box. And that's when we see the square diamonds like on the on the pattern on the wall. He follows her and these other girls all fucking day. Follows them on the in the car. They stop at a high school to get this code. That never comes up. And I'm sh- yeah, I'm sure it what it's seven five one on the high school scoreboard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd be curious what that means if anyone figured that out. Yeah, then follows them in a paddle boat and the pirate grabs the stuff. Then gets back in the car, then parks at this hotel. They have to know they're being followed. Like, what the fuck? You know what's really stupid is that he follows them all the way to this uh, party. And then he kind of enjoys the party and somehow ends up in the pool. And then he's hiding behind the beach ball, which is so funny because I'm like, pretty sure I've done that when I was like 13, like trying to get closer to like a conversation of group of like girls. And I'm like hiding behind a floaty. Um, and it's like so, broad daylight and they just see you and like, what the fuck is he what doing? What the fuck is he doing? Yeah. And um, uh, from what I read, no one's no one solved what 571 is yet. So that's a mystery still still in the uh, wind. Um, and so. I was like, oh, man, how he's been following them all day. How is he going to approach the conversation? I bet it's like the so nuanced, very smart. He's had all day to think about it. No. Hey, do you know this fucking girl? (laughs) He ambushes this girl in the woman's bathroom and then doesn't expect to get like. Need in the balls and then like cursed out. And then barked at. So that's another one that kind of like helps your case that he's the dog killer right he kind of sees women as dogs and they all bark at him yeah um the balloon girl we didn't talk about who every time i see her in a movie i'm like why why does that girl look so much like shailene woodley and it's grace van patten from meyerwitz stories which we did yeah um and 
yeah, so then there's the Bloom Girl, and then Jesus and the Brides of Dracula are there, too. And then we finally meet Alan for the first time, his friend that we talked about earlier. And yep. he gets given this cookie to the next show, and they're like, if you break even a little bit off of this, you know, you can't go in. And then we see the billionaire's daughter finding out about her dad being dead. Um, and then he's he's followed home, but that's like that could be another like sort of schizophrenic episode. I yeah, with like the shadowy creature thing. Yeah, I was like, is that the owl lady? Yeah, uh, it, could, gets, it could be right, but also like you said, it could just be him. Right. Well, he finds out about the owl lady after this, and he could think, oh, that's an explanation for. What I wanted to talk to you about this, and I totally forgot until this shows up. Right, the skunk sprays him in the face. Yeah, but also. He's smoking a cigarette before the actress uh, Bang shows up, right? And he's she's like, what's that smell? And doesn't it seem when he goes, oh, it's skunks in the back of the apartment in the forest. Doesn't it seem like that he's like making it up? <laughs> well, I thought we saw a skunk before that. I don't think so. I thought, well, I, because when it happened, when it actually got sprayed, I was, we had seen the skunk before. We'd seen a skunk, but not before that scene. I thought he was like smoking something that she wasn't a fan of. So uh, he was he was lying to her about it. But they were smoking in the bed after sex. Yeah. So I was like, that doesn't make sense. And I was like, oh, there's actually skunks. That wasn't a lie. There's actual skunks. Because um, I thought he lied and then he like ironically got sprayed in the face. Yeah, so he gets sprayed, he goes home, and he finds out that the billionaire was bar- was burned alive with three women, and he sees Riley Keough's hat. And I gotta tell you that I never once thought she was dead. And I, the movie plays it pretty straight that she's dead, but I was like, there's no way she's dead. And like then towards yeah. the end of the movie towards the end of the movie, I was like, Oh, maybe she's fucking dead. <laughs> like oh, right at the end. That's funny. I was like, maybe I was wrong this whole time. It is weird. That that character is in three scenes and then two sort of scenes. Right. Like, she's very small part in the movie. So I guess that originally was supposed to be Dakota Johnson, and she had to back out. I imagine she might have backed out just because she's like, I have a huge fucking career now. Like, after yeah, doing I gotta do, Shades. I gotta do Madam Web. I gotta Web. do shit where I'm in more than three scenes is what I gotta do. I gotta star in Madam Web. Um, speaking of Madam Web, Sydney Sweeney is in this movie with the smallest part I think I've ever seen her have. If she was bigger at the time, I feel like she would have been the escort that came over back to his apartment. You know what I mean? That's how I felt. I was like, I was very disappointed it was not her. I gotta tell you that. <laughs> wow. Gotta okay. tell you that. Dude, you had to tell me. That's good. I had to tell you. Yeah. So gotta also when off my chest. <laughs> yeah. No one knew what you were thinking. So there's plenty of other opportunities for you to see Sydney Sweeney. So um, then when he's talking to the actress, he's like taking the tomato bath and he's talking about his van and white and the messages for rich people. And she, and then he's like, Oh, you think that's a little weird? She's like a little, <laughs> a little weird. At the same time of this, I think she's the one talking about the owl kiss lore, but she's talking about it with her nose plug. So it's all this like nasal narration. And well, um, she's just, reading the magazine to him, basically. She's reading the zine. Yeah. It's called a zine. David. Shut the fuck up. So he then sees Riley back in the pool, but then she's naked, but then it starts to be like a dream. Like she's barking. Barking and at him. He's seen a bunch of shit. And then the next morning, the cops are creating a crime scene around Riley's apartment. Do we ever figure out why? Because she died in the car. They traced back that this oh. was her. Oh, right. Okay. I guess. So, yeah. So that's why I actually, up until the you asked, I was like, yeah, I didn't understand what happened. And then there's this point where he sees all these hot women walking down the street and he follows them. And it's a movie audition from a guy that looks like he's like, hey, want to be in a movie? Um, yeah. I don't know why that's in there because <laughs> they start to smell him. And then he turns and sees his car getting towed. Um so he just has to walk to the zine writer and this is like the zine writer has like life masks all over and he has like what johnny depp next to grace kelly and then he has abraham lincoln and um yeah and then this is just when you get all like he says this line which i think is so funny he says man i really need to get a family and i'm thinking like oh like he needs to get a life and he's like yeah yeah yeah. no and it's not he goes i really need to get a family who am i gonna leave all these to 
I'm like, no exactly. one, dude. No, no, don't leave the, any of these to anyone. And I like how, but in the universe of this movie, everything that guy says turns out to be real. And like even the, oh, there's a map in this cereal box. Yeah. So after this, he goes to Topher. And this is the drone, the drone over the reservoir or Silver Lake, whatever you call it. And he goes over to look at this lingerie model to basically look at her changing it naked. He's like, yeah, but you got to wait a while. And it's like, this is so sad. And they kind of look at each other as this is so sad. And then the lingerie model starts stripping and as she's crying, cause like her life is sad. And then it's sad that they're watching her. And <laughs> Andrew Garfield's like, all right, man, I'm going to, I'm going to head out. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the more like more comedic things, but only because it's so grounded in like realistic like like the way human emotion is right but also it's just sad and pathetic all at the same time and it's almost like the music stops like when it when it like shows her crying and starting to really get emotional it's like this really sad music and when it shows them and andrew garfield's like okay dude i'm gonna go the music just stops yeah, and also this is another scene where it kind of leads you to think Topher's like something in this because he's like, Andrew Garfield tells him about, oh, I'm being followed and uh, Topher's like, yeah, that's just the modern persecution complex, right? We don't have anything wrong with us so we'd like make up stuff that's bad things that are happening to us. And like at every point he's like, ah, now you have nothing to worry about and but it's it's just a red herring. So next he goes to the cemetery and this is where he meets Sydney Sweeney and they get in the limo with the pirate. Apparently... The scene they're filming in that movie is a recreation of a scene from the director's first movie, Myth of the American Sleepover, which that's, I think is a movie we should do at some point. That's funny. There's um, there's this story I have when I was in L.A. I was over at Shane Black's house and um, I can pick that name up. You just dropped. <laughs> um, it was a big party. There was a lot of rooms and a lot of things going on. But Taylor and I just so happened to kind of walk into like this really big theater room he has in his house, which of course he does. Right. Um, but they're showing this like really bad shark movie. And as I'm looking around, I'm noticing that everyone around me and, and Taylor are people who are in the really bad shark movie. <laughs> and uh, it just becomes like this huge thing where they start laughing at their own bad acting and jokes and bad CGI. And everyone's having a great time. It's a very LA thing to do. I feel like, but for him to like experience that where he's like, he's watching a movie, he looks to his right and it's the two actresses in that movie. I'm like, damn, this director does not miss with like the intricacies of Hollywood life. I like to, they're like, Oh, so what do you think? And he's like, Oh, it's yeah. I mean, I just got here, but it looks, it looks neat. So, um, he then, you know, they go off. So he goes to the secret uh, to the club with the cookie. <laughs> he eats the entire cookie, which later on, Bloom Girl's like, "How much?" I love how eat? he eats it too. He just like <laughs> basically is like a fuck you to the security guard. Yeah, uh, and we already started talking about this. She takes him down to this crypt, and you think like, "Oh, is she gonna have him fucking killed? Why are they going down there?" And then she's like, "Yeah, I recognize Sarah. I don't know what happened to her, um, but I know my friends wouldn't be involved." And like, you really like you can't wrap yourself up in this. Like, you know, there's nothing to be gained from this, which is true. Right. And it is like, you think, Oh, all these people are in on it. And it's like, no one was in on anything. Right. Sarah made a choice to go live with this guy. Maybe now there is something the zine writer says about all the, like the marketing to make women more like pliable and amenable to men and showing like all, you right. know, it flashes all that. And so that's like plays in big to the end of the movie. And like, her obsession with that movie specifically the yeah, yeah. Who wants to marry a millionaire could have been like a brainwashing tool to like make her susceptible to agree to this. Yeah. So she's like, we should fuck. And he's like, yeah, but then he gets sick and then she leaves. Um, he leaves. Uh, no, he sees and chases the blonde girl, but he passes out in the cemetery. I love when he wakes up the next morning, his mom calls him to say like, Hey, I'm going to send you a VHS. Do you have a VHS player? Cause I want you to, I want you to watch this movie about Janet Gaynor, I think is the name. Yeah. And then he wakes up and he's sleeping on Janet Gaynor's grave. Yeah. And then later on when he goes to the billionaire's house, he talks to Millicent and she's like, oh, this was painted by Janet Gaynor. Yep. And it plays into nothing towards nope. the end of the movie. Not at all. Also, we never find out who or why killed Millicent. 
I think it would probably be someone who's like she's getting too close to things. Like she so she finds the bracelet, right? The bracelet that Sarah had as she said that her ex-boyfriend carved and it's like a move in chess and we know someone who likes chess cuz we've been to the chess party. The chess party where he beats up Jesus and uh and then Jesus just doesn't know anything. The only thing Jesus divulges is the fact that all of his hit songs are written by this unknown songwriter, which he connects to being the same songwriter that has like those lavish parties in like a gated neighborhood. Yeah. So um, he starts listening to the record backwards when he wakes up, trying to figure this out. There's this one scene where he's jerking off to all the magazines. Yeah. And I was like, is this a period piece? Does he not have internet? Actually, I so I was uh I had a pause it and I told Taylor that I said, you know that scene in every every like PI noir detective movie where the, the jerk deta- off scene, yeah. No, no, no. The detective has like the big board in front of him with all the like the strings, and he's finally figuring out all the clues and they're lining up in front of him. This is that scene, except Andrew Garfield's jerking off to it. <laughs> so he sees the ad for the escorts, calls the redhead over. Um, and she basically what he gets from this is that, you know, there was this producer, this music guy, and we weren't allowed to go into um, into the, the guy who makes music. We weren't allowed to go into his house. She was like, there's this producer who makes action movies based on household cleaning products. I was like, what is that supposed to be? Evolution. <laughs> anyway. So there, he's then finds this code in the letters and he's like, he's counting the letters and he's like three. And then he like gets to the word alone. He's like alone. One, two, three, four, five. I was like, it's, alone has five words. Like, why did you have to count them out? It was like, is that for our benefit? Like I thought it just, was every, th- I thought what he was doing was every third word or every third letter. No, he was counting how many letters there were in it, hmm. in the word, which he should have been able to do a little bit easier than he did um rub dean's head stand under newton which he immediately obviously everyone got was go to the observatory and rub rub james dean's head and then stand under sir isaac newton yep and then the hobo king takes him to a fucking bunker here's my question the the songwriter wrote the song and the lyrics were the cipher to the code. So whoever, I guess, was aware of the code would solve the cipher, go to the observatory, rub James Dean's head, stand under Newton. Hobo guy came, took him to a bunker, and then they were just allowed to live in the bunker from there? Also, if that bunker was designed in that if like that bunker is the same as the other bunker, then Riley could literally leave whenever she, you know what I mean? Like there's not a whole lot stopping you. He just like fucking ended up in a, in a Incomplete dairy order. case. Huh? Well, I think he ended up, yeah, he ended up in like fucking Walmart or something. Maybe you but... think they like blow it up. So, but also like, is the hobo King like contractually obligated, obligated Dude. to take anyone down there? Cause it's like, he sees Andrew Garfield. He's like, well, clearly you're not supposed to be here. So why? I don't know. Whatever. I guess I'll just do it. I'm paid in fucking buttons to take people down here, like rubber pieces of rubber. And doesn't flint. seem like a good financial move on his part. Um, the I don't I know. Was, man. I, he said he's like, I'm the homeless king. I was like, you're the hobo king. I like hobo king a little better than homeless king. It's not your title. You can't decide. The entrance had hieroglyphics. I was like, oh, we're doing a whole uh, like Egyptian pharaohs thing, which they do bring which back. They do later. bring that up. Yeah. Um. Oh, the thing about coyotes, he's, you know, he's like, oh, coyotes, we follow them. And then he follows the coyote later on. So after this, he he goes to the zine guy's house and the zine guy's killed himself. He doesn't tell the cops about the secret recording room because he wants to go in. So he goes in and he sees the owl lady. Not only does she, he see the owl lady is going to go kill this guy, but then the owl lady like looks at the camera and basically like looks into Andrew Garfield's soul. He's like, <laughs> oh, fuck. Right. Um. I gotta say, I gotta say, for a uh, owl lady, pretty hot. Pretty hot, yeah. I would wood, wood bang. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, 
even if the even if it was like a legitimate outfit, if it wasn't just a costume, it was like that's who she is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep, I know. So he calls. I I love the cut though. You're you're getting to it. I love the cut where he's just running down the sidewalk with the cereal box in it to his chest. And then he calls Alan. He's like, I need to speak with Jesus. <laughs> and so he's like, do you like chess? He's like, not really. He's like, okay, well, either way, that doesn't matter. And they're just, they're pretending to play chess, but neither of them know how to play chess. I thought that was pretty And he's good. like, are you sure you want to do that movie? He's like, absolutely. And then he beats Jesus as he takes a shit. We get to see Jesus as shit, which is like the triangle symbol in the, in the toilet. I was it like, was I also mean, gold. Yeah. I was, either way, I didn't need that. I didn't take a, great gander at it um and then he finds out that oh the songwriter you know told him the songs so he talks to the balloon girl and sydney sweeney and the redhead like hey can you take me to the songwriter's house which i'm surprised they would even know where it was because i would think that they would be like blindfolded to be brought there but they knew like hey it's over that wall well, you know, maybe these Hollywood producers that took her like wanted to seem, you know, like big shots like, oh, we're in this part of town. One thing that's kind of interesting as they're walking him over, he talks to Balloon Girl and she, he's like, oh, you're an escort too. She's like, yeah. He's like, what were you in? And she was like, I was uh, in a soap opera from five to six months old, which is like kind of one of the most fucked up parts of this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Because earlier the redhead girl is like, yeah, want to fuck the girl from this? want to get a blowjob from the girl for this and it's like balloon girl is like oh these guys want to fuck the five or six you know the girl who was the five or six month old from the soap opera 20 years ago or whatever like what do you i mean it's the same thing about like whoever wants to fuck the olsen twins right well i guess but like the five or six months is the point is the part i'm like really stuck on i mean she was she was in a thing as a as a baby no i know it's fucking weird. Well, especially because it's her only thing that she was in, right? Exactly. Or like, well, it'd be weird if balloon. it wasn't, and it was the only thing she mentioned. She's she comes over to guy's house, and he she's like, "So, uh, it's you you saw me in the soap opera." He's like, "What?" Yeah, she's like, "I was six months." What? No, fuck, that's disgusting. I saw you as balloon girl at a party. What the fuck? Get out of here! <laughs> Who do you think I am? Yeah, I wanted to fuck balloon girl. Uh, yeah, anyways, fucking crazy scene. Then Where's your balloons? Out. I love I love how she just kept, keeps like a cache of balloons like in her blouse. It's all it's her thing. Um and then the billionaire scene and um you know, he's basically I wonder how much this scene cost all the licensing they had to do for all these songs. Like for the funniest way to start out with like you have to have a, a like a really like well-known catchy song and like I want it that way by the Backstreet Boys is kind of a perfect one. He's like, you yeah. did that fucking song? And then he just keeps going. Um, and then he almost kills Andrew Garfield. And then Andrew What's... Garfield destroys his head. <laughs> With Kurt Cobain's guitar, which we talked about Kurt Cobain earlier in the movie, too. Which it's it's so funny because this is a kind of a period piece because this takes place. So he's supposed to, Sam is supposed to be 30. I, I did the math. Sam is supposed to be 33 years old. This movie takes place in 2011. So he would have been 16 in the last Kurt Cobain live concert, which I'm guessing that's the one he saw him with, with Dave Grohl. Right. Okay. And um, he was like, yeah, I saw Kurt Cobain perform live and I got his autograph. I'm like, no. And he's like his daughter's autograph. I'm like, that's better. That makes more sense. Um, but no, so he bashes his head in and he's talking about all these songs that he's created. And what's a, it's kind of a scary thing is that he's like, I made all the pop songs that you dance to when like deep in your teenage angst, I created that. He's like, your father danced to my songs. And then he did like an O to joy, which is like a song made in like the early 1900s. Like, uh huh. This guy has been around for a while. I was like, okay, so is are they saying that this is like the devil? Is he a devil? Like a uh, devil went down in Georgia for the the fiddle, right? Okay. Or if if Sam kills him here, is he going to have to take his place? <laughs> He's got to learn how to play the fucking instruments. I, but I was gonna say it has shown that 
you know, he's not very good at playing guitar or doesn't really show that he knows how to play. So I don't know. I don't know what he was trying to do, but he kills him. And then we kind of just leave the scene. And then a cop shows up to a victim later, right after the owl kiss tries to kill him, which I guess you're trying to think what she's there for him. Yeah, but it, I mean, to me, that was just all in his head. I don't know that the owl lady actually exists. No, I'm talking about the cop. Like he he looks at the he looks through his peephole and he sees the cop and he's like, "Oh fuck, they're here to arrest me for the murder." But then the, he's just trying to evict them. Yeah, I guess I would have assumed. I don't know. I I I would have assumed it was for. I I always knew what it was. I guess I don't know. So I didn't even think. I didn't even consider like, oh, this is you know for something different. Um. So the cop gives him one, one more day and he's in the landlord's like, no, I want him out now. She's like, I'm handling this. Don't be greedy. He then follows the coyote to the billionaire's house, tells Millicent, hey, I'm, I'm investigating this girl. And she's like, what have you found? And they go start going on a walk. We already talked about like the the, um, you know, how she's like, oh, if you could kill a dog, you could kill people. And he says no. Yeah. So then they go into the reservoir. And she's she's like. I wanted to. I wanted to talk to you. I just wanted them to think we we're gonna fuck. And he's like, "Oh, oh we're not." <laughs> and then she gets shot and she dies, posing like the first girl he ever jerked off to yeah. on the Playboy. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that, would you? Let me ask you. That's some symbology. That, that is some symbology. Well, let me ask you something. Would you ever be able to masturbate again? There's like very few things that would stop me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 To that picture, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> sure, to that picture. I just mean you it's just the mean first. In general? It's, just, it's the first thing you jerked off to. So I, I don't know. Maybe it like scars you a certain I'm way. A, I'm a fucking professional on nothing's. No. This is. You have to business. separate personal from yeah, what I understand. You know, maybe you got to com- compartmentalize. When it's game time, you, you have, have to be you have able to, to come go. Partimentalize? <laughs> anyway. So then he goes back and it's deciphering code time again. Like he's fucking finding the Zodiac killer. And he <laughs> NMP apparently means Nintendo magazine page one. So, OK, so uh, hold, hold off on this for a second. One, we have this scene where he wakes up and his the gum is stuck to his Spider-Man issue. And that's such a scene in the first Spider-Man. I don't know how they convinced him to be like, oh, we're going to do this, but we're also going to like. This is a reference to the fact that you were Spider-Man. Okay, sure. He, seems, he just seems like he's game for anything. Um, and then I used to collect, I still do, because I still have a bunch of issues from when I was a teenager. I collected Show and Jump Weekly magazines that had all the anime in it. And I have like 90 to 100 issues of, of that. This is the situation. The fact that that random engraving means Nintendo Power Monthly is the fact that if I'm Andrew Garfield and I stumble upon this weird thing that like I'm trying to uncover and it just so happens that my old back issues of a magazine of anime that I used to collect when I was a teenager all of a sudden fucking came in handy. Yeah. I don't know. It was a like little. The it's odds a little bit, of it are. It's a little too cute, right? That part of it. A bit. But he figures out that this is the chessboard, draws on it. And it, when he draws on it, and there's like this water feature in the middle, I was like, that's the reservoir, obviously. Uh, which made me, once again, I was like, that's where Topher lived, right on the side of the reservoir. Topher's not involved. <laughs> he then has to get the other map, which I was like, all right, well, then why did you need the Nintendo map to lay this I was this wondering over that too, yeah. I mean, maybe when combined, they whatever. And so it's like a, it's like the Zelda map on top of the on top of the serial map was like because the serial map is a map of Hollywood. Yeah. And then the Zelda map was the cipher to say from what point to what point. I but guess. he had to draw in the coordinates, so it's still like whatever. Um, but it also doesn't make sense because you're just you're just pinpointing two points on a map. The Silver Lake and the and he also if he turned it upside down yeah I don't know like it didn't seem like it seemed like he only needed one but that's not let's we can move on okay. then there's no satellite image of that area he goes to Mount Hollywood hobo guide says this is not a safe place oh I guess you're the yeah you're right because he he wouldn't know exactly where to go specifically until he saw that that satellite had no imagery on it right um 
and then he finds a guy in a shack with three girls in the right very midsummer looking not just um, any three girls the three girls that he followed in the white rabbit which the white rabbit that car being the white rabbit being is like a very alice in wonderland sort of reference exactly so finds out that wasn't a bunker you're in. It was a tomb. It's about ascension. Pharaohs did it. Yada, yada, yada. Stay in there for six months, food, sex, then we'll ascend. Um, and they're like, oh, well, we can call Sarah. They can't call out, you know, in case they get scared. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? So he calls her. And I love there's this little bit where he's like, she's like, I'm going to go take this in my room. Um, and the, the other roommate so this is just funny because the other roommate her name's stephanie moore i read this little thing in there she is just naked in the scene walks up to the phone just standing there completely naked just sitting on screen waiting for the phone for riley keo to answer in the other room and apparently she was quoted as saying like she's super comfortable with nudity when she went in to film that scene she just stripped immediately they weren't even ready to film everyone's getting set up and she's just sitting there naked because she's like i don't really get what the big deal is and like thank you for your service but it then goes to riley keo and while she's going there the guy's like hey man there's no way out for her please don't fucking make her scared you're really gonna fuck things up and then riley keo's like did i make a mistake and he's like maybe and she's like Oh, well, nothing I can do. And like, I think that kind of like almost snaps, uh, you know, Andrew Garfield out of it. She's like, hey, man, this is the way it is. And she's also like, as we said earlier, she's like, why are you so infatuated with me? Like, we met once. Yeah. Like, why am that? Why am I that much of a big a deal? This is the way things are. You got to move on. And it is. It is sort of the closure that he didn't really think he was going to get. Although, except the fact that he's kind of a serial killer who's killing dogs. And so the closure then sends him back into like, oh, I'm a dog killer again to me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Also, why does this motherfucker keep accepting random drinks and snacks from people? I literally like, do you want some tea? And I was like, don't drink the tea. I said it out loud. I was like, don't do it. Oh, he wakes up chained to a ta- chained to a chair in like the bottom of a well cave thing being interrogated by the hobo gang. You know what I thought was interesting? And like, this is, it, it's either a shooting mistake or maybe it was supposed to, but the, so they're in this hut that is thatched and there's little light holes throughout. There is a shadow that passed through the back of them, of the, like a person walking by the holes in one of the scenes. And I was like, is that just someone working on the movie or is that supposed to be something? And I think it was just a mistake because then the hobo king pops out of the hole in the ground. Um, I also like how she's like, Sarah is coaching him. She's like, well, why don't you get a new dog? That'll make you happy. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, sure. Uh, that was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, okay. So the hobo king questions him about his dog treats in the car. And he says, might be a lie. Might be the truth. We don't know about how he had an ex-girlfriend wanted to get with her fed her dog treats so he just had extra in his pocket same thing with sarah and i guess because he didn't admit that he was the dog killer the hobo king was like good enough we (laughs) we do all this nasty shit but we fucking hate dog killers so we would have fucked you up and killed you if you were the dog killer but since you're clearly not you can go and i love when he's leaving he's like are you we're done are you guys gonna you're not going to kill me? You're not gonna, he's, he's like, I don't think so. I don't think we so. Might. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we might. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucking good. And then as he's walking out, he sees his ex, who he's also been sort of, I think it's very subtle, but I think he like, I think he really was troubled by his breakup with this girl. He sees her being covered by the, by the McDonald's clown. Last one, I swear. So when you look at that poster, um, I think it's every time you look at the poster, but definitely the last two times you see the poster. If you look at the bottom left corner of the billboard, there is a, it says E equals EE. So one E equals two E's. That you're supposed to take from the coffee shop Morse code that says these three words. And you're supposed to be like, oh, one E means two E's. So these three words is the website. And the symbol for the website 
is the three slashes, meaning like Hoboko danger, right? Yeah. And then you plug in the Zodiac sign into the geocache and you get the mountain thing. And that's it. That's all the clues that I found that Reddit found in the movie. There's totally just like a signed script in that mountain. That's like it's <laughs> or or that's where all the bodies are. That's true. So um, then he goes home and the stay quiet symbols in his apartment and he's watching the movie his mom sent. While do you think eating. he do you think he sees the stay quiet symbol or because it really doesn't seem like he sees it until he's in the older woman's apartment? I don't think it matters, but I took I was like, oh, he sees it once he goes in the other apartment. Um, that's when I thought he first saw it. And he eats the crackers and OJ yep. that Riley showed him. And then he goes over to fuck the bird lady. And I was like, oh, is he just going to fuck the bird lady to figure out what the bird is saying? Because he hears the bird, which, by the way, apparently the bird's saying Hollywood. I thought the bird was saying Oliver. But the, according to the Internet, the bird is saying Hollywood. Why? Um, Why Oliver? That's just what it sounded like. I don't know. It's just what it didn't sounded the girl, like. Didn't the girl say Rodheim? Who's Rodheim? Who said what girl said Rodheim? Um, it, it was either the actress girl or Sarah. And they're like, what is that bird saying? And it's like, I think it's saying Rodheim. OK, I'm just telling you what I what it sounded like. So it says Hollywood, which. OK, big deal. Yeah, anyway, this. so and then he's out smoking, looking at his place. The cop and landlord walk in. And I was like, oh, I, I guess he just f- he fucked the bird lady for a place to live. Like, that's yeah. why. Although there was a shot where he's looking at the cop and landlord come in. The landlord turns around, sees the hobo sign. He's like, what the shit is this? Um, and it goes back on to Andrew Garfield and he's smoking. It's the last shot of the movie. Did you fully think that that curtain that he was standing in front of was going to peel back and it was the owl lady? Going for the final kill. Do you think the naked hippie chick is just the owl lady? That'd be no. that'd be interesting. I didn't think that. And what I none of the Andrew Garfield is the dog killer. None of that I would have connected except just the way he looked in that final scene was evil. He looked like an evil guy. Yeah, you know what I mean? he's throughout the whole movie. He's just not a likable character. No, but he is. Just the look he is giving, the music, the way like he looks like a guy who kills dogs. Like I think that's what that scene is like. That's what that scene is portraying to me. Like if you go back and watch that scene with that in your mind, that scene is the director saying, "This is the dog killer." I bought the movie. You bought what do you mean digitally, um, or did you buy the Blu-ray? No, digitally it was um. So it was three dollars and fifty cents to rent it and five dollars to buy it, and I was like. Oh shit! I might honestly just buy the digital too, um, for five bucks. Why not on Amazon? Yeah, yeah. Don't ask me how I watched it the first time. So, yeah, I don't know. I think to me, and I like as I finished the movie, I was like, "Is this a crazy thing for me to think that he's the dog killer?" And then I clicked on the first like under the Silver Lake explained, and they're like, "He's the dog killer." <laughs> so <laughs> I was funny. like, "Okay, I'm not. I'm not if on you- an island here." Uh, Taylor and I went back and watched the first scene as he's like looking at the girl scrubbing beware of the dog killer off of the window. And the way he's looking at her scrubbing beware of the dog killer is pretty ominous. And then as you go through, you're just like something is just not right with this dude, you know? No, and I mean, that's I, hard. That's weird. hard to think. That's hard to think about, too, because it's Andrew Garfield who is almost always very likable in his films. And I think that's why it works too, right? Because I think, you know, part of like the Topher Grace being red herring is I think, you know, he's played sort of a bad guy in movies. So it's like a little bit like you could have been like, oh, and and also he's playing the small part. They try and sort of hide his face in a lot of it. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I mean, having andrew garfield as the guy who's never really played that um at least to my knowledge it 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 made it surprising and why like throughout the whole movie watching it i was like this is okay i like that they went for it's kind of a mishmash and then that end scene sort of brought everything back for me and i was like oh shit i I like really like this because it 
it made me forget that we were like, who's the dog killer? And then in the end, it's like, oh, hey, but it's been the guy you've been with this entire time. He's actually not a good guy. He beat the shit out of a kid. He bashed the dude's face in just because he made a lot of great music that he loves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to be fair, he pulled a gun on him and tried shooting him, but sure. Um, he was already coming at him. The, the, uh, yeah, maybe. I, I, I think this movie is one we're going to revisit again. Maybe not on the pod. Maybe on the pod. Who knows? But I think down the line, we almost have to revisit this movie because it is a movie that grows on you. I, I feel like, and I feel like this is a movie that a lot of people want to discuss. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I definitely get that. I, um, it's just one that I kind of definitely want to watch again. I was actually thinking about this. I really just want to put brick on this week and like have that in the background while I do. I've never work. seen it. I know. I mean, we're going to do that. That one's, Friggin' awesome. Uh, and one Ryan Johnson's first, maybe his first, I don't know exactly. And then Joseph Gordon Levitt's awesome in it. So, um, but yeah, this was, I don't know. It, what, what I, what I like about A24 movies in general and like why we're doing this month is like the movies sort of go for it. Yeah. Like they choose movie, you know, they're not, they don't always, they're not like a studio that I think a lot of times is like, hey, let's do this movie. They like, People come to them and they're like, yes, we'll produce that movie. So they sort of have a certain type of movie they do now. But they choose movies where people go for it. And I don't think we've done a movie more that is fucking going for it than Under the Silver Lake. And like maybe to its detriment in some places because it like a lot. But I like a movie that like when I finish it, I'm like, dude, I could fucking put that right back on because like there's so much in it that I want to like catch again. Yeah. And I think you just have to accept that like maybe Hollywood is just full of this like folklore. And this movie tries to bring a lot of this to light and you see a lot of that, but it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, tie into the plot cleanly or exactly. And then you just have to be okay with that. And if you are all those things, I think this movie really works for you. But but yeah, no, I mean, I I like this movie a lot and and I think it is one that's going to grow on me. Thanks for listening to another episode of I Finally Watched. This is David. And this is Alon. And we finally watched Under Under the the Silver Silver Lake. Lake.